Coffee Break with BBA Fresh Brew 5, Journey to Sea Suite, featuring Paola Saad and Enya Wood, presented by Banking Book Analytics. Well, welcome everyone to Coffee Break with BBA. We have um, another great episode. So Coffee Break with BBA, it's basically a part of our social media engagement with the banks and credit unions as we organize a series of events such as webinar and uh, also the coffee breaks with the leadership. The key objective of a coffee break BBA is trace the career path of successful executives. And there are two takeaways. First is giving back to the community uh, for the youth to emulate and follow the footsteps of those executives in that those areas. And also the knowledge transfer, you know, for the peers to learn with the experience of the executives. And uh, this is the first episode that we're going to attempt to do a podcast as well. So look for our podcast um, in looking uh, for the webinar uh, at this, this presentation. And um, yeah, and right now I am going to introduce our guest. So our guest is Anya Wood. She's the Director of Learning, Development and Design at the Canadian Credit Union Association, this is CUA. Anya has worked in the field of learning and development for more than 20 years in a wide range of industries, financial service, telecommunications, healthcare, post-secondary education, and also uh, professional services. I guess uh, I think she'll speak a little bit about being a consultant as well um, during our chat. Um, her areas of expertise uh, use emerging learning technologies, learning strategy, and building partnerships. Anya holds a Master of Distance Education, has authored eight academic journal articles, and has presented at more than 25 industry conferences. Welcome, Anya. So Hi. nice to have you here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yes. Um, so BBA has been working with you at CCUA in delivering some courses, and that's what triggered um, sort of our interest in you know more um, learning outcomes and learning strategies, and uh, and it's really fascinating what you do. And you're a lifelong learner. And um, but what made you get to that? What what make did you fall into sort of the the learning path? Or did you knew you was a career path and you just went for it? Can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about it? That's a really great question. For me, I really fell into learning and I and I loved it. So I was um, finishing school. I was learning software development and I was hired on by the company to to teach. And I loved it. What a great combination of being able to teach and interact with people, but also keep that technical element. And that turned out to be a mix that I've been able to keep throughout my whole career. That's awesome. So that's how you got into basically sort of learning technologies. Mm -hmm. and you, you're a developer because you're like, oh my God, that's that's really, really nice. Yeah, you, and then you teaching, combine. Just, teaching took over my career, but always with a technical technical element, so. That is super, super cool. So our second question, um, in your first position, uh, you stayed seven years and you was at the Information Technology Institute. And you pioneer a uh, problem-based co collaborative uh, learning approach. And you kept rolling out the programs with innovative approach, such as work you did the design, developing a groundbreaking learning uh, management system, the LMS at uh, CoLearnX. Can you talk a little bit about that and what kind of effect that program had, if any, in your career direction? Yeah, for sure. Those are both really exciting initiatives that I was part of. So at Information Technology Institute, problem-based learning is was brand new for us to roll out in that in that organization and it was pretty pretty modern approach at the time and what that consisted of was in a in a software development environment we would go to our learners provide them with what we wanted the end result to be hey you need to by the end of this semester develop a piece of software that will do xyz and then instead of teaching them, you know, running through a regular curriculum to show them how to do that. They came together as a small group, five or six people per group, and they had to figure it out. And then we acted as coaches to, to guide them when they went astray or to teach them something if they ran into a problem. But it was extremely interesting and quite an innovative approach at that time. And it turned what it ended up producing are people that could really think and weren't scared with how to solve a problem. And it was fascinating to help uh, shape that way of learning. At CoLearnX, it was 
completely different. It was a really cool project for me. I was part of a startup company. And mm -hmm. at that point, we were looking to build a learning management system that was different than what was currently on the market. And e even to a great extent today, a learning management system, people log in, they launch their e-learning, it tracks it. Um, but we were looking to create an environment that was synchronous. And it was new then. You see it now when you go in and do learning through Zoom or through Google or through Teams where uh, there's a lot more collaboration. But back then it was really unique and it was really fun project where we're pushing some, uh, some boundaries. But I'd say both of those were impactful or meaningful to me in the uh, career wise in the sense that with problem based learning, we were um, exploring and teaching something that was non traditional. Uh, at Colern X, it was part of a startup where we we're trying to develop something for a market that hadn't been done, that wasn't currently part of the market. And both, both uh, from a career perspective, made me uh, very excited and very comfortable pushing boundaries and trying new things without fear. So that's how it helped me that way. I, well, first of all, I when I look at when you were talking about um, the first part and I'm thinking, well, this is really a startup mentality where you have when everyone's collaborating in a project and pushing forward with that, it's like whiteboarding and, and collaborating and learning as you go. Uh, and we all know today how important that is. And we so much so that we all do it. So you're really a truly pioneer in, in doing that, which is congratulations. That's really amazing. And and when you do it, and so, and then it, it was really, and then you told me that you know CoLearn was a startup, but I didn't know that. So it really sort of uh, it's so seamless your transition from innovation to I start up. There's doing more innovation on top of that. So it, I I love that the sort of learning technologies uh, that you're working on that are a reality today. You must be very. Uh, proud of that oh no, that well, accomplishment I mean, I as well. can't, of course take credit for you know the products that are out there today but it was so interesting to be involved before those were out there and starting to to think about how it might be in the future and that those experiences have have really shaped how i approach things uh even today. You, you develop the mentality in the end of it you develop an approach but really you develop a mentality on on how to work and how to learn and how to collaborate which yeah. uh, in it and i think if we don't have that mentality today i don't think a lot of people will be in business right you know? exactly it, it's even more important today than it was a few years back and and even earlier than that because you can't rely on a traditional job in the way that you may have a several years ago and you need to be innovative and creative and have that mindset that uh, will allow you to succeed regardless of what the lay of the land is. Yeah, and also the, the traditional learning that doesn't really work for mm -hmm. everyone, you know, mm -hmm. very more experiential. As I said, like I had learning disabilities growing up, you know, like ADD and dyslexic and uh, an approach like that would have been more suitable than the, the normal classroom approach. But of course, we didn't know you know, back then, we didn't know how all those um, new ways of learning could impact uh, some of the students that were, were not really uh, doing so well as well as they could do in the traditional form of learning. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, another question that I have for you, you were a collaborator at the Learning uh, Solutions Publications and also authored and co-authored published articles. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be found in high profile academic platform, um, Sage, University of York. Um, I was totally impressed with that, like with where I could find your articles. That was pretty cool. Um, which of the written work, if any, had the biggest impact in your career? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yes, I've published a few articles. I was really lucky to work for a uh, healthcare system and I worked for a group of academic hospitals. So that was something that they really encouraged. And when the opportunity came, uh, yeah, I dove in. It was really scary. The one, the first one that was impactful for me was the very first article I wrote. It was very, very, very hard. And it was brand new territory for me. And uh, I was extremely proud of it. And so it was impactful to me personally. 
Career-wise was likely the Brandon Hall article that I wrote. And at the time when I published it, they were uh, quite influential, influential in the industry and they were very well known. So writing for them gave me some street cred and, uh, and yeah. that probably helped me from a career perspective to have that showing on my, on my CV. So the first the article that you mentioned was the one in the um, uh, outcomes of learning for the nursing. Right. Yeah, that looked, I was looking at their article and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like so much research. <laughs> I actually thought about it. I'm like, this probably took a long, long time to write this article because it was so detailed and there was so much research in it. But yeah. uh, and, and the cool thing is that even for a lay person like me, uh, it was interesting to read it. Oh, well, that's sometimes, nice. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to do that when you're looking at a, something that you don't really know anything about. But I think when you write a paper and I'm thinking back on, university times and you know doing my masters you know at that, those kind of uh, writings that you sort of had to assume that people don't really know what you're talking about you know and and you did that and, and you laid a foundation and then you went into the article so yeah it was a lot of work but i think it was it was worth it thank you um, it was worth it but it was still especially the first it gets a little bit easier but the first one were really tough yeah, going back, uh, you know, when I was thinking about to sort of continue to learn and when you do university and you stop and do your the postgraduate and you stop and do a master's and you stop. And a lot of it is just learning how to learn and learning how to write and learning how to write for that level. Mm -hmm. So it's always um, a new experience really, you know, cause it's something that you haven't done in a while and you're in your new school and new professors and the new sort of per, uh, public that's gonna be reading that, that article. So you're always, um, having to upgrade and learn how to work in that environment. Yes, and I'll, I'll add to what you're saying. Writing for school, it's usually well-defined. In university, you, you have some parameters. When you're writing for a publication, you need to be presenting your own ideas. So there's so much less structure, um, but, uh, but still interesting. Sure. Yeah, which is good and bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have like both there. Um, I would like. I have a, a, a sort of last question that we had, you know, for you. But after that, if you have time, I want to go into a little bit of diversity in that industry as well. So the the question that I had for you was um, from a junior professional student point of view. Mm -hmm. What advice you give the person that's starting in that path? You know, in the learning industry, by be the, for the finance industry or other industry, because honestly, it's sort of like a crossover. When you go, uh, the common element is sort of the learning technique and having to innovate in the learning technique always. So, what would you um, advise that person that's going in that career path? Yeah. So, once you've found the field that you like, my advice is just jump in and try new things. So in learning and development, I'll use that as an example, there's some core things that you need to do in your career to establish yourself as an L&D professional. You need to teach at some point, um, you need to develop curriculum, but my advice is pick up all the quirky things that cross your path, all those little oddball projects that don't fit that traditional path of what you think you're supposed to do, because those really round you out and give you experience that you don't know where you're going to pull from later it also sets you apart from uh, from everybody else when you when you are pulling your resume or or your cv together the other thing the other piece of advice that i have is to try those scary things so mm -hmm. public speaking is sometimes scary for people but it exposes you to a really broad audience. So find some way to push yourself on those things that are scary. Maybe it's writing. Uh, and there could be hundreds of other things. But try those pieces because those will also set you apart from, from everybody else because people don't want to do it if it's, uh, if it's intimidating. And uh, that, those are great ways to put yourself ahead of the pack. Well, you, you brought up a lot of great points that like, I think they're going to resonate with a lot of people. Um, I'm like personally, I'm the kind of person I love change and I love learning new things, but, and I could be talking to like a tree, no problem. But when it comes to public speaking, um, I've always had like big fear, like a mm -hmm. big fear, you know, it's just because I, sometimes I, um, I speak too low and sometimes I go too fast, you know, when I'm speaking. 
and and I understand sort of my the things that could go wrong, but at some point um, in my career, I had to do a lot of public speaking. And so I actually also went to mentors and people that spoke really well. And I'm like, can you help me, you know, in, in doing this? Can you help me in, you know, I'll, I'll tape it. I'll send it to you for you to see if this is it. So in the beginning, I did a lot of that so that I could even learn with mentors what I was doing wrong. So, uh, and in the end, I wasn't doing that much wrong. So it was really good for them to come and say, well, this is really not bad. I don't know why you think it's so bad, <laughs> you know, but, but we, we demand so much from ourselves, but at the same time, um, and, and we're looking at outside and, you know, peers and you, you, you don't want to be judged at, you know, in like in a public presentation of not knowing what you're doing. But in fact is if you don't try it, you won't know how good you are. That's number one. And number two, there are always resources. A hundred percent. You know, I, that you can, you can go to. I like how you brought up mentorship. I think where there's opportunities, it's leveraging, leveraging people that you know in the field or have done things in the field and that helps. And to your point, you know, I think we're our own worst critics, uh, yeah. right? And just trying to, recognize that if you think you're not good at something it's probably you overthinking it just just try and uh, and jump in and expose yourself to as many things within your field as you possibly can and those would be that would be some of the advice i'd take away. yeah and the other part that you said there i thought was really interesting is um be curious you know go into other fields be curious uh be sort of innovative in the way you think by looking at other industries and you know in your case other ways of learning and even very different to, you know in in finance and and different things to be around like around this kind of person because as especially as a learning professional you sometimes you have to pull stuff out of the hat you know and you <laughs> you know and you to innovate and make people interested and um and as you you're you're field goes really cross industry and i think being well-rounded is a huge part of it so that you again you're not afraid to be in a conversation about something else or you know new learning techniques just because it applies to a different industry that's not yours right that's and, very true yeah and talking about that and, and talking about uh, you know sometimes fear to go forward and lean in how is sort of you think the role of women you know, is in the learning field and the role for you as, as experience as, as a woman in, in going into um, the tech field. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, how that's was a really good question. I, think, I, I will, sure. I think in learning and development, 100%, it's a more equitable field than some of the other professions. So I, as you can see from my LinkedIn profile, I've worked in a lot of industries. So. Um, for example, in professional services, as in accounting, that may be may more male dominated in certain roles than female dominated. Um, but learning and development, you have more of a more of an equal mix. So I think we're we're good there to start with. Um, but as far as uh, technology, now that's a totally different story. I recall being at Information Technology Institute and and teaching there and none of the, nobody else could solve a problem uh, it was just a coding problem and they looked at me and I said well, what's going on they're like oh I can't do this and I jumped over and I happened to know I happened to have encountered that issue so I could solve it really quickly <laughs> everybody's jaw dropped and I I was so shocked and I realized at that point there was such a long way to go and I don't I don't think that we've moved the bar as much as we need to but I do see the bar I do see the bar moving slowly it uh, it's funny how little moments like that it just clicks mm -hmm. it's probably something that you were not aware of before mm -hmm. and uh in that moment it just clicked like oh my god it didn't expect me to be able to do this and That's solve right. something that they couldn't solve right um i remember for me it was a moment uh being a you know consultant and entrepreneur and having my company and in business development, I did about 40 different sectors, you mm -hmm. know, uh, before BBA uh, from 
nanotech to you know bovine reproduction technology like wow. everything like uh, you know planes and oil and gas and mining and technology communication all that and I'm a very curious person. Like I learn, I say that I learn very fast, and I forget even faster. It's like this <laughs> the upload and download when you do uh, so many different things. But um, one thing that really marked me it was, um, and usually I was the, you know, this is maybe ten years ago, eight years ago. I was the only. Usually I'm, I'm the only female in right. the room besides the receptionist, you know, and. Um, and I'm this presentation I'm near to the front. I, I know the presenter really well and, you know, and happen to also know, you know, his wife was like a big sort of, you know, she's a journalist who's on the feminist side. And, and um, even though this person was a diplomat and, uh, and he's like, gentlemen and gentlemen and gentlemen. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> right in front of you. <laughs> I'm like I went for dinner at your house two days ago. Like, really? like can't you not see me am i and it's and you can see it's this this um sort of this this frame of mind and and of course i didn't really stop and say ah, hello i'm here you know but i did talk to him and his wife after like the next time i saw them i'm like oh my god this is what your husband did <laughs> you know <laughs> like, and uh and, the, and then I just told me after like thank you for telling me this and i think he became way more aware uh, in going into any room, like in a way, it, it's. Um, I know him. He's someone who, it's very open to you know having women entrepreneurs and supportive and, but the frame of mind of just being with men all the time, at this kind of uh, events, it's it it just came through, and I felt. Uh, I don't know if I felt singled out or I felt sort of uh, invisible or alone, like. It, it it was this mix of feelings that I will never forget, and it was that that moment where I really got what it was to be a, a woman surrounded and not be seen as a woman, you know, right. not be seen as a female, um, like we are today. And in, I, in that sense, we went like a long, long way. Uh, I think I remember going to the World Economic Forum here in Toronto, like mm -hmm. again eight years ago, and I maybe in that room of like 200 people, there was five, maybe six women and two of them definitely were not like professionals. And uh, and I remember Christine Legard was there as well, she was speaking. And I look around and I'm like, where are the ladies? Yeah. You know, so, and then like a couple of years ago when we still had, you know, events like that, I went and I'm like, and I'm looking around and I'm like, this is pretty good, you know, like about 30%, like it, it was a huge, not many years and a huge jump. And it could be because women feels accepted more and those kind of, you know, more more comfortable in being in those events. It could be that they made sure they invited um, also females and not only the males, but I still get correspondence, you know, dear sirs, I'm like, I don't even respond to correspondence like that. <laughs> It, it is changing, and I agree with you. Yeah. When you go to uh, events that are traditionally very uh, male-oriented, you don't see that as much anymore. You see a much higher percentage yeah. of women. Um, but we still have a little ways to go. But it's encouraging, I would we, say. We do. And I like that CCOA, um, you know, a lot of the top management, the CEO is, is a lady. Like, and, I, and the culture inside CCOA seems to be very... Um, geared to the way ahead actually in diversity and inclusion compared to um, other organizations. Yeah, I, I would say that there's a conscious effort to be in inclusive. I think we've done very well, as you were saying, from a female representation and we're, we're always looking to, to make sure that we're paying really close attention to things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice because I was working with looking at some credit unions and sort of great like there was a lot of movement in the credit union space. Um, you know, the executives, you know, moving positions and transitioning to other credit unions. Um, and I remember seeing that every time I saw a woman becoming a CEO or a woman CEO or a CFO, I'm like, good for them. You know, mm -hmm. so many of them, all I had was a list of the top management. It was all male. So the ones that had female, especially the ones that had more than one female, which is not a lot, I was like, good for them because they are making an effort because again, this kind of innovative approach, this collaborative approach that we have, you know, it, it 
we need everything. We need women, we need men, we need different genders and different backgrounds to really bring sort of the Canadian mentality and the innovative mentality to the table. So absolutely, you're so right. Absolutely. Awesome. So the last question we had is really what we call the crystal ball um, <laughs> <laughs> question. And it's really uh, something fun for us to do. So when you look at sort of uh, the world and let's say the credit union environment uh, in about a year uh, yeah. compared to now, in terms of learning and innovation, mm -hmm. how, which changes do you see, um, you know, and what you think will stay the same or go back to what it was in that environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think my, my answer is really, um, even broader than credit unions, it's just learning in general. What I'm what I'm observing is, and you're right, it is crystal ball question. But what I'm observing, yeah. especially over the next three to four years, is more of an em emphasis on learning in the flow of work. So it's not a new term, but I I'd, I'd say that probably at least for me, maybe you, maybe others, one of the ways that I learn the most is when I when I have a problem, when I need to figure something out. I don't always proactively look for a solution until I'm faced with it. So yeah. I go to Google, I go to YouTube, and there's always thousands of resources that will help guide my learning. So I think what that means from uh, I guess where my vision is of where things are headed is, especially in adult learning, is a move away from more traditional learning where it is, you know, this is what you need to learn in order to mm -hmm. uh, be confident in this topic and more of a, lear of, of a shift towards accessing learning on demand as needed, likely. Uh, so some things that are very solution driven, uh, probably shorter focused answers to common problems um, and definitely a move away from traditional instructor led. Now, not not in a year. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. we're still going to have traditional learning over the course of, of the next couple of years, but I predict a movement away from that where learning is shorter and focused on real world problems where people can grab that knowledge as they need it in a very um, small piece of information that addresses that, that sole problem. So basically what you're saying is that um, Whereas now we have to go through, let's say, a whole, you know, three hour course to to learn something, to get an answer to this little piece that we're missing, because we might know the other stuff already. And uh, so it'll be more focused. People will be able to, okay, this is the, what I need to know within this context. So they, they go within that context, grab that piece of information and use for what they need at that moment. Yes, and it and it is a shift, and it's not it's not the only solution because for sure people need foundational material and they need context to what their uh, uh, a new field or a new concept, and that m will still continue with those longer two three hour pieces. But I don't think people are looking at that as their only way of getting answers to their questions. And now that we have so much available on places like Google and YouTube and other other forums. They're going to look to their learning to be like that when they have very focused specific questions. There's an expectation that they'll be able to go out and get the answer or the context around that particular problem. Doesn't mean that they don't need that background and that's where those longer pieces will come in. Um, but I think people will demand more answers that are very specific to uh, a set of issues that they might be encountering at any one time. And, and con in a concise manner as well, right? In a concise manner. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think holistic learning uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I think we need a little bit of everything. I don't think the answer is this or that. I think learning can be um, very holistic in a way that you need the foundation. And hopefully we're going to have in-person, you know, instructors again, because it is a very different um, um, dynamic that you have, you're you're more open. You can see in someone's face if they have a question, and you can stop and ask them, like you know, is everything clear? And, and I think there's a sort of enhanced learning that way. But then what we have now it means that um, you know we have a course, and people from all over the world, not only all over Canada, can be part of it. For sure, which, 
you know, so there's sort of positive and negative from all of them. But as you said, you know, the holistic it would never go away in terms of like the dynamic learning. But that piece, I, I agree with you, I think will be very, very, very important, it's, especially as people move ahead and they need answers really fast to very uh, particular issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, this is great. I think uh, we could, I had actually have so many other questions for you, <laughs> but I think our time is is, uh, is up. But thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you so much for participating and sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, and we look forward to engaging more, you know, with you and CCUA and uh, really in learning professionals in other areas that can help people understand. Because I think no matter the industry, we're all learning all the time. And it's really, to, for me, it's fun to understand how to learn and what's coming and really how things started back there and how, in comparing to how it's working today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for including me in this. Thank you. Thank you. Till next one. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today at Coffee Break with BBA. Um, we look forward to our next episode and having you all here. Um, you know, in the video world, as we were talking, it's helping us work through uh, uh, these difficulties and challenges and making it fun. And so thank you so much for participating today in our video and our podcast, and we hope to see you soon.